Hello, and welcome to the Unsung Cyber Heroes TV Network. I'm your host, Gary Berman. Our mission is to shine the light on the people and organizations who keep us safe online, while at work, home, and school, and to serve as a networking platform for the cybersecurity and information technology community. We've learned that 62% of human communication is nonverbal. That's why we include a video feed, so that you have the option of seeing our guests or simply to just listen. We're also called a TV network because we facilitate business to business networking collaboration. Our strategic plan is to be a force multiplier by introducing people and organizations to one another and to our audience based upon the principle that a rising tide lifts all ships. Today, we've invited an amazing group of thought leaders in cybersecurity to discuss what's keeping them up at night about the current state of cybersecurity for small to medium businesses. What role does a managed services provider play in protecting clients? What are some of the unique challenges facing MSPs? What are the standards that they use or recommend, such as the cybersecurity maturity uh, certification model being developed by the Department of Defense? And given the new normal of working at home, now how have their organizations adapted to this rapidly changing environment? And how are they working to enhance cybersecurity for other organizations? All this and much, much more on today's episode. I'd like to start by welcoming and introducing our amazing group of guests today. First, we have Corey Munson, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at PCMatic. Hi, Gary. Charlotte Tupita is the Cybersecurity and Data Protection Lead at America's Small Business Development Centers. Hey, Charlie. Gary, hello. Blake Dowling is the CEO of Aegis Business Technologies. Hey, Blake. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you all so much for uh, being here today. Uh, uh, Corey, let, let's begin with you. And, and since uh, my uh, origin story deals with cybersecurity comics, uh, tell us um, your origin story. Well, a as a company, you know, we've been around for about 20 years. The company was originally founded by a gentleman who was a senior vice president at Gateway. So if anybody joining us, uh, maybe their first PC was delivered to their home in a cow spotted box. There's a, there's a good chance that our CEO and founder or else even myself as part of his organization back then had something to do with it, but uh, grown into be uh, very, very focused on endpoint security here over the last 20 years, primarily as a consumer product, but increasingly we're working more and more with SMB in that sled space as well. And uh, you know, I have to say it about the cow boxes. Uh, did it move a lot of product? It moved a lot of products. Uh, how many uh, cow jokes have you heard in your career? Almost every one imaginable, I think, by now. <laughs> well, okay, we won't do that here. Uh, but what we will do is welcome uh, Charlie. Hey, Charlie, when did you realize your passion for small and medium sized businesses? Well, a long time. I've started several small businesses in different areas and always been interested in, in um, supporting small business from that perspective. So my time here at America Small Business Development Centers, we have 4,000 advisors that are out helping small businesses every day. Um, as you can imagine, you know, we're part of the uh, small business administrations with their, their arms and legs on the street. You can imagine that right now we're helping all kinds of small businesses to understand where they are financially and help them reconstitute when, when we get things back to, to work and helping them, helping them with loans. I'm responsible from the cyber perspective of making sure that we do everything we can to help and guide them through uh, cyber, uh, good hygiene and cyber, so. Yeah, we're gonna talk a lot about that because you know, from uh, what I understand, you know, SMBs are kind of like sitting ducks because they, they don't think that they have anything worth, you know, stealing until they have it stolen or encrypted, right? That's right. Yeah, so we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, hey, Blake, uh, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Uh, my background, I went to the University of Florida, literally my background. After that, I moved to Atlanta and uh, started my career. Sorry for the moo joke, couldn't help it. Uh, worked with the Fortune 5000 space in Atlanta and uh, Took a lot of those enterprise level methodologies to the small business space in Tallahassee, Florida, where our MSP is located. Uh, we support about 200 organizations under contract and work all over North Florida. And that's what keeps me busy. And we can talk about what keeps me up at night later, but you're right on. The SMB space is uh, highly targeted by hackers and it's something we deal with every day. 
Well, let, let, let's stay on that, Corey. You know, um, so wh why are they so, you know, such attractive uh, targets? And, you know, how do you, as a managed service provider, I mean, I've been, you know, hearing that, uh, you know, the criminals are attacking MSPs because, you know, it's efficient. If you can, if you can hack an MSP, um, then you might have access to their clients. Is that a valid, you know, concern? I think it's a very valid concern. I mean, if you, you're talking about the low hanging fruit and the ability to, to easily uh, hit one MSP and then you hit potentially hundreds of customers all at the same time, um, you know, the, these hackers are about profitability. They're, they're about efficiency, right? So uh, if there's money to be had and there's an easy way to do it or an easier way to do it, they're definitely going to expose holes in RMM solutions and everything else uh, along the way. But the, uh, you know, the, the MSB community, I, I'll, I'll throw this out at you, Gary. I saw this survey popped up on the wire yesterday from Proofpoint that said that um, this was 3,500 working uh, people across the world. It wasn't just limited to the U.S. That 60, only 60% 60 knew what phishing was and only 30% knew what ransomware was. Wow. Now, this, this is after, you know, me personally, I'm sure Blake and, and Charlie have, have done the same, out uh, talking to every community uh, uh, group I possibly could, working with our MSP partners to help them educate their customers and their communities about the threats. We're a year into this, if not more, and 60% of the people out there don't even know what ransomware is. Um, there, there's work to be done, and the security issues that existed before the whole COVID outbreak are just doubled down now, if not more. You know, it's it's so uh, important and timely that you you know you talk about ransomware. Um, you know, uh, in, in our work in creating the comics, we we created a character called Wilbur Wannacry. Um, you know, who was named after the Wannacry uh, ransomware attack that a, a couple of years ago that uh, just devastated the health system. You know, uh, what what do you think, uh, Corey, about um, the health the health ecosystem now? You know, being being vulnerable to ransomware attacks. I think this goes back to, again, the, these folks are looking for profitable opportunities, right? And if, if we are more sensitive to making sure that healthcare operations are sustained and up and operational on a, on a sustainable basis, right, um, they're going to prey on that, and they're going to prey on that particular concern. Um, it, it, it all ties back to, to the money, right? And, the, and the, the quest for profitability. If there wasn't money to be, to be made here, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be doing this. And they see this, this as just simply a, a new opportunity. Healthcare has is, is always been straight in the crosshairs, even more so now. Yeah, it's kind of sad. You know, you would think that they had, you had criminals have some humanity, you know, to at least uh, slow down, you know, or, or, or not do it, but it's just the opposite. You know, attacks are up using COVID related, you know, phishing emails and everything. It's just, it's just uh, very, uh, very unsettling. But, you know, the question then, you know, to you, Charlie, is um, so you have a, a small, a medium business and, and, um, you know, maybe you can explain a little bit more about what the Department of Defense is doing regarding the cybersecurity maturity uh, model certification, you know, known as the CMMC. Um, can, can you tell us about, uh, you know, the, the motivation? Why are they doing this? And what, what exactly is it? And how, you know, is it fair for small to medium businesses? Can they comply with these requirements to be able to work with the federal government? Well, sure. Well, the, the, the CMMC, our perspective from the CMMC is that it's, it's a collection of, of public available standards that they put together to help small businesses uh, protect confidential information. That's what we're talking about, right? Where we, the confidential information about a company's intellectual property, their employees, private information, payroll and, and health, maybe records, um, records of anything that you touch that when you, when you're doing a, any work with a client, you should assume that any of the information that you're, you're getting is confidential and that you should, and you should protect it. It's up to the client to make the decision of whether they want it to be revealed in the public, in the public's view, right? And so as a defense department, as you know, the defense department has a lot of secrets and um, it might not be top secret information, but any one of the pieces of information that would be uh, put together with other information can in, in fact have some detrimental effects on the defense industrial base. 
So they, they're, they're leading the charge. Um, we're using the CMMC as our North Star because we needed to have a, a framework to point to that is the what, this is what you need to do. And because it's publicly available um, standards and frameworks that they're pointing to, then uh, it makes it easy for us to tell and help customers understand what they need to do. Our role is really to um, make sure, let's go back to the hygiene perspective here. Um, it's, it's a really great time to tie them both together as we're learning that we need to wash our hands more like our moms always told us and other things naturally be, be more careful about how we're de dealing with things. We need to do the same thing and, and consider our own cyber hygiene and how we're protecting this, this important information, right? And so um, um, on the 15th of this month, um, we're, we're releasing a new website that points everybody to the CMMC as a North Star. You mentioned accre uh, accreditation um, sometime at the end of the year and in, in the beginning of next year, the Defense Department's gonna be putting out demands in their contracts for organizations to be certified at different levels in the CMMC. That's their decision on what they're doing. So it really, it, it really doesn't affect the way that we're approaching what we're doing and that we're, we think it's a good business decision to do this. And if the Defense Department asks for the certification, then that motivates the business to do that. We think that uh, businesses should be motivated outside of that that this is just a good business decision. So as we're talking with managed service providers and products like uh, PCmatic, um, what, what we're doing is we're asking them to align their products and services to the controls associated with the CMMC. That would be more about the how to do that. We're not really into doing talking about how to do that. We just wanna make sure companies are using good best practices and we're, we're informing them about that, what the CMMC is. We have actually um, some training that's gonna be released next week so people really understand in layman's terms what this is. An average person may go into looking at the CMMC and, and just start seeing all kinds of references to standards and, and Defense Department language and all kinds of things. It gets kind of confusing. So we've, uh, we've put this in layman's terms and we're gonna make that available so that when, when these people come to um, the managed service providers and, and companies like PCMatic, that they understand what they're looking for, and then the PC Matic people and the and the products, the managed service providers can align what they're doing to that. makes it makes the whole thing more efficient, the whole system more efficient, so we can protect our small businesses. That makes a lot of sense. And and Blake, you know, so what what does what role does a managed services provider play in protecting clients? You know, what are your fiduciary responsibilities about uh, you know, data privacy and and, and cybersecurity? Well, you know, best practices, um, Charlie, I just heard you say that, uh, those two words have uh, grown over the years to incorporate so many different things. And now best practices, redundancy at every, every level, standardization, these words mean so much more. They don't just mean keeping things under warranty and under support. They mean following best practices in regards to cybersecurity, password protocols, not just your antivirus and your anti-spam, but your advanced threat protections. and what else can I be doing? You know, that's the question I hear all the time from presidents and executive directors. What else can we be doing? And there are tools to answer that question. You know, these days we love two-factor authentication, obviously, as everyone else on this call does. But to go to those numbers that Corey was talking about, those 60% of people that don't know what phishing is, they certainly don't know what multi-factor authentication is by name, except maybe their bank, that maybe that financial transaction Maybe that's their only exposure to 2FA. So we're trying to roll out password uh, tools to generate those complex passwords, advanced threat protection at the firewall level and at the RMM level. We talked a little bit about the, the vulnerabilities of the RMM platform, depending which one, but the new tools that are out there to go along with existing RMM functionality, like locking ransomware, which it doesn't do it a hundred percent, but if you've heard of companies like Third Wall and what they're up to and Huntress, um, again, another product that we're trying to bring to the table to look for that threat that is not the ransomware or the phishing, but what happens when you click something and nothing happens? You know, when the keystroke tracking software is installed and nobody knows about it, your RMM tool isn't detecting it, uh, your IT manager or your MSP might not even know about it. So it's throwing everything we got um, at the wall and hoping, hoping that the customer embraces it and that it sticks, but to have some standards to follow 
whether it's HIPAA or IT, uh, always helps the case and makes the MSP's job easier because ultimately it's about money. Um, is there a budget for it? And unfortunately, unless someone goes through a cyber incident, they're probably not as likely to embrace that extra budget that's required unless they are IT savvy, which again, the numbers Corey provided says they're not on the average. Yep. Well, you know, so Corey, just to, you know, to build on that, um, you know, in the new, nor new normal, at least for the time being of working at home, um, how is PCmatic uh, evolving, you know, in this rapidly changing in environment and, and how, you know, how is uh, PCmatic working to, to help secure small and medium businesses? Uh, well, let's just talk about internally, um, and I hate the term, but PC Maddox has been a virtual company for 20 years. We've never had a headquarters. We have 50 employees that have been working from home. Uh, me personally, I, I work from home for 15 years now. So mm -hmm. it's been business as usual here with the exception of, of my team who usually jumps on planes every other week and heads to a new trade show or out to visit partners. So internally, pretty much business as usual. We've, we've been ready for this for a while. I think to, to go to your, your next point, and this goes back to what, what Blake was saying, is I think one of the things we've really tried to do at a partner level now is, is one, be genuine about our, our desire to get out there and help them, right? I, I mean, they're hearing from everybody every day of the week about a new product that, that we want you to sell as a partner. But how genuine can you be about, we want to help you grow as a company and, and weather the storm? I think everybody is getting the emails now about we want to help, but how much of that is genuine and how much of that, that is, that is real. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it, and, and I'd be curious to get Blake's thoughts on this is we're still hearing from partners that need help communicating risk to their end customers. We have too many partners that want to go out and talk about speeds and feeds to a small business owner who, who really doesn't care. They have no interest in how the sausage is made. They're worried about business continuity. They're worried about whether they're going to be able to pay their, their employees going forward and, and keep the doors open. And as long as you as a managed service provider can convince them that there's enough trust between the two of you, that, that all the technology stuff's gonna be taken care of, they're not gonna have to worry about it. Then, then that relation can, relationship can go forward. But too many of our partners still want to go out there and talk about the technology. Um, and, and so that's one of the things we really focused on is how can we help partners get over that and, and enable those communications and those conversations. So Blake, I'd like to jump in on that for a second, yeah. Karen. I, I, I agree with you. Um, small businesses need to be able to speak efficiently about their needs and, and efficiency is a part of that. So the, one of the, one of the uh, values of the CMMC that it, it points out where uh, products and services uh, need to be um, considered as part of the, the cyber hygiene, right? So when we speak about managed service providers, managed service providers can come in as you look at the standard and they can say, well, if you, if you work with us, you can inherit these controls. That might be that we manage your cloud services. That might be that we're the CISO in the box. That might be that we're handling your encryption, your multi-factor authentication, that, that they're, they're, they're actually coming in and, and doing that management that you can't do yourself. You don't have the resources. You're busy building important things. Um, and so uh, again, back to like even, even products and services like PCmatic, they actually have a function that, that is clearly represented in the CMMC that they can align to. So if, if a client comes and takes a look and sees that gap, it, it would behoove companies like that to actually align their messaging to that, uh, makes that conversation a lot easier. Uh, it, it reduces that friction because when they start looking at products and services, their their minds are out here wondering what this is. And, and it's really, products and services are really just parts of things that they need to come together to do. And some products and services can map to multiple, multiple um, controls associated with uh, keeping yourself in, in good hygiene. So that's, that's kind of the conversation that we want to lead that, that these products and services need to map to this thing. It's not, I've got the best widget in the world that does all kinds of things in all kinds of ways. 
that's that's really confusing to a client because they have they, they don't have the time to fit through or work through all these things and figure out where where it maps to their problem yeah you know and uh and we'll turn it over to blake to add on this one quick point i, I had heard recently that uh, at least for enterprises you know larger companies they can have as many as 75 or 100 different solutions in their in their cybersecurity, you know, stack. Um, I mean, they probably don't even know what they have, you know, plus or minus. What do you think about that, Blake? Well, from what the question you just asked and from what Corey was just saying, uh, it comes down to value, really. And uh, a manufacturing facility I was talking to on Monday was trying to trim their budget. And what do they're like, what do I need? What do I absolutely have to have? Be my tech translator. That was the word she used, which I loved because I'm the, uh, you know, I'm the CEO with a background in sales. I'm, my background isn't in the technology necessarily. And uh, the way I like to guide someone through that conversation on value and what you have to have is, well, here's what we have. We have redundant internet connections. We have two-factor authentication. We have on-premise and cloud backups. Here's what we use for antivirus and anti-spam. And unfortunately, as your tech translator or the old school word, trusted advisor, which I still like a lot, it, uh, it really tells a story. But you know, you have to have these tools. The minute you start saying something's not important, say it's a, say it's two-factor authentication that you just added in 2019. You know, you, you have to be very careful, especially during this spring and this coming summer, on where you can trim and where you can't because you have to balance the value and the functionality. And unfortunately, most of these tools aren't free, but what is free, there's so many trainings out there. There was a great product that Novafor put out there, the um, web, web enabled training out of Tampa, Florida. They put out a free home course training when this all started that I shared with our entire client base. Hmm. What, you know, Props to them for really stepping up to the plate and giving something of value to the MSP, uh, or excuse me, the MSPs that they work with as well as the end users that we support. So kudos to them and, uh, you know, balancing value, functionality. Hopefully that answers the question. Well, you know, also, Corey, uh, you said something, you know, r really that underpins everything, which is risk, you know, and tolerance for risk. You know, uh, how how does a smaller medium business make that calculation? Wow, how how many hours do we have, right? <laughs> you know what what I increasingly I I think um, th there's a real dependence on MSPs and then SSPs to help make that that calculation. Um, most SMBs can't attract the IT talent that they need to have somebody on staff to do it in-house. Um, if they even could, could they, could they, do they have the resources? Could they even pay them? So I think what we see is increasingly, increasingly that SMB client is turning to the MSPs and the MSSPs of the world to help make that calculation and, and help make that determination. Heck, you know, there are good MSPs out there that have a, a handy dandy calculator right on their website that'll allow you to punch in some numbers and, and spit out some, uh, some calculations for you to, to, to weigh. But it, to us, I think that's where it's turning. I don't know that so much of it's happening internally as, as it is happening in conjunction with their, with their IT partners. Wow. And, and by the way, for our listening audience, uh, we're going to have links uh, at the end of this in our show notes so that you'll be able to get more information about each of our three guests and uh, also maybe some other relevant information like, uh, Corey, if you'd be kind enough to forward that survey, you know, that you talked about um, or the calculator, you know, that you're talking about or Charlie, you know, you mentioned uh, your new website that's uh, going to be going uh, live and Blake, I'm sure you have some cool resources as well. So, um, you know, before we end uh, the recording of the show or, or after we end the recording, if you could just stay with me and make sure that uh, you, I can receive all this great information so that we can share it with our audience. Is, is that all right? Sure. I did want to tag on to his comment just now about the finances and that, that our organization or the 4,000 advisors for free uh, have been advising companies um, for 40 years now on finances. 
So we help them if, if, they, if they engage with either one of the organizations and they need to figure out how to capitalize, how to find cap access to get access to capital, we help them with their loan application. We understand which banks are, are more likely to support certain types of activities, certain industries. We physically walk in the bank with them to help them get loans or help them find tax breaks, um, grants, and these all kinds of different things that, that there's access to capital. That's kind of one of the things we specialize in and helping them understand that, that they probably aren't gonna jump in here right up front and spend everything and get it all done. That they're gonna to have to figure out like what, that, what they were saying, where, are the, where can I get the most bang for my buck? And the managed service providers and different people can help them with that. Where, where can I get the most out of it? You know, understanding what the architecture is and how they're, they're doing their business and their industry. How can they get the most out of the, the dollars they can spend now as small businesses? Yeah. And, and uh, also just to build on that, Charlie, um, so now with all the uh, infusion of capital, you know, uh, that has uh, been directed toward the SMB market uh, pertaining to COVID-19, how, how, how is that going, you know, from your perspective? Well, we, our, our advisors are out there helping people get through the processes. There's certainly a lot of money being thrown around. Also, from COVID perspective, we're the center for the federal government's effort to inform small businesses, and we actually have a website that that you go to that has all kinds of training, and it, it is a general information from the federal government to small businesses. So we're really excited about that. But um, I'm not, I really don't have much to do with the distribution and of the the finances. I'm really focused on the cyber side, so I, I, I I'm not sure about how, how that's all going. I have friends that have received grants and or loans and that type of stuff, but uh, I'm, I'm busy working with <laughs> the cyber is enough for me right now. Yeah, and data protection. Um, so just as we're uh, wrapping up, uh, you know, on behalf of the digital universe, thank you all for, you know, what you do. And uh, let me just uh, leave it open here for a minute and ask, is there anything else that anybody wanted to amplify or to add uh, that, you know, we, we haven't covered so far? Feel free to do that now. Well, you know, if I could, the, uh, the spirit of camaraderie that I've seen this spring, I was watching 60 Minutes a few nights ago. Uh, Scott Pelley did a piece about uh, the healthcare workers in New York. It was really powerful. And um, on a much smaller level, I'm not comparing our work to their work by any stretch of the imagination and a salute to all those healthcare workers. But the camaraderie amongst our team and our partners, it's really, really been tremendous because people are just dropping what they're doing. Not just my staff, mind you, but uh, partners of ours out of state, nationally, internationally, that are just going above and beyond to help our clients during this time. Because as an MSP, you know, our phones blew up for about four weeks straight for those that weren't ready to work remote. I mean, Corey, your company, you've heard a lot of that talk. We've been doing this forever. Uh, we've always worked remote, but a lot of people haven't. You just assume people are agile and ready to go work from home, but so many people just struggle to get that basic functionality set up, whether it's a webcam or a VPN connection, whatever it is. And um, everybody working together, it's uh, in a non hokey way. I just like to try to share that sentiment that it's been really special to play a small part of, of that mission here in North Florida, helping people stay in business. And um, that, is, that is all. I'm glad that, uh a Florida person brought up the Hokies uh, in Virginia. <laughs> Thank you for that reference. Uh, we, we're at war, so I, I just like to leave it. That we're at war. If you don't think we're at war, then uh, I think uh, you've got a real problem ahead of you. We, we really are at war with nation states, organized and disorganized criminals. They're coming after us all over the place, and we need to have really basic hygiene. So um, our, our program is going to really start to set the bar for basic hygiene in cyber and, and move people forward. Uh, and we're really looking forward to that. Yeah. And, and Corey, you, there's something that just stuck in my mind that relates to this, this feeling that, uh, that Blake so eloquently put in the purpose of our mission. It's why we're here today. Um, Corey, you, you mentioned the word partners. You know, what, what, what is that? What is the PC Matic partner program, if I could call it that? Sure, our, our partner universe is, is uh, multifaceted, right? We, we partner with multi, uh, managed service providers, managed security service providers, resellers, affiliates of all, all types. So, um, you know, we're, we're still small enough and nimble enough as a company 
that we're able to figure out exactly how we can best partner with a particular company that's interested in doing business. Uh, I, I really resist the urge to have some sort of cookie cutter channel partner program that everybody has to buy into and participate in and in very uh, uh, carved out steps. We get pretty creative about how we work individually with with the partner based on on their communities. But you know, I I'll echo what what Blake said. You know, one of the things that I really admire and and we've really had a lot of good deep conversations with our managed service provider partners over the last thirty days or so, and knowing that they not only are trying to navigate their own businesses and keeping their business afloat and deciding which of their employees they can rely on or which employees may be home or need to stay home. And at the same time, trying to address their customers' needs that are desperately trying to, to uh, stay afloat themselves. And like Blake said, you know, rapidly migrate their entire workforce home in the matter of two, three weeks. I, I really, um, I give a shout out to all of those, those partners out there because they have literally been on the front lines of trying to to make sure these businesses can can uh, continue, yeah. and doing a lot of work at the same time of trying to manage in house their own their own companies. Well, with that, um, again, on behalf of a grateful digital universe, thank you for being the unsung heroes that you are. Um, you're perfect for our mission to shine the light, you know, on the good works of people and the ideas the rising tide lifts all ships. And I hope in a tiny way that, uh, you know, our little TV network is, is uh, helping uh, support that effort. If, if you would like to be uh, a guest on our show or to nominate an Unsung Hero, uh, please just send me an email at uh, Gary at Cyberheroes with an S, comics with an S, uh, dot com. So thanks again to all of you. Stay safe and um, have a great day.